title of the event is uh, Psychedelics in Scotland, the Future of Mental Health. Um, so we've got a wonderful panel here today. Um, they come from all sorts of backgrounds, but they're going to explain a little bit about the current landscape for research, both in uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK. We've also got some um, people who have lived experience of psychedelics as well, so we'll be hearing from them. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a neuroscientist. I'm an ex-NHS doctor. I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry and I've also worked on NICE and SIGN guidelines. But my current passion and possibly the most rewarding thing I've done is working with military veterans and spouses who are in crisis. And that's part of the reason that I've got involved with some of the psychedelics work. Um, so I'm also going to put, just talk a, bit, a little bit about <coughs> background and put things in context, which is just to talk about some of the uh, statistics uh, about substance misuse and mental health in Scotland. Short and sweet, it doesn't make for pretty listening, but in 2021, there were 1,300 drug deaths in Scotland. In 2021, there were more than 14,000 drug-related hospital admissions in Scotland. In 2022, for over a three-month period, there were more than 10,000 <coughs> referrals for substance misuse and alcohol misuse to community services. That's just within a three-month period, and that was incomplete data. Um, 2021, there were 753 suicides in Scotland, and there, I've seen published an estimate that one in four adults in Scotland over a year-long period is expected to have mental health problems. So these are very sobering statistics. Having said that, we are at a very exciting time because for a long time we've, we've been treating mental illness and substance misuse um, with the same drugs over and over again. And now we have an exciting time where there are new therapies on the horizon. Um, we've got a re huge reinvestment across the globe in psychedelics research and research into psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And it's fantastic that lots of research evidence is now being disseminated across the world. And a lot of that is thanks to the pharmaceutical investment. There are a lot of companies competing in this area now. So they are at the forefront of, you know, a lot of it highlighting the public awareness of um, mental health, but also the, the potential that these treatments might actually um, bring for future therapies. Um, in terms of where we're at across the globe, Australia have stepped forward recently as the first country to legalise um, the use of certain psychedelic compounds. And that will come into effect in July 2023 when MDMA can legally be prescribed by a psychiatrist for PTSD and psilocybin can legally be prescribed by a psychiatrist for treatment-resistant depression. These drugs have been rescheduled, um, but they are still controlled drugs, so it will be heavily monitored. So I'm going to move on to our wonderful panel now, and I'll introduce them one by one as they speak, and we'll be open for questions afterwards. So I'm going to start. Uh, to my right is Professor Joe Neal, who is Professor of Psychopharmacology at the University of Manchester. Joe has a long distinguished background in drug discovery, and she is on numerous committees related to um, use of psychedelics <coughs> um, and other medicinal compounds. And she also runs her own, is it consulting company? I uh, used to, yes. Okay. So she's heavily involved in the drug discovery, but I will let Jo introduce herself. And she's going to talk a little bit about the barriers to research in Scotland and the UK. So thank you very much, Ailsa. Thank you to, to um, Anna and Fiona for organising all this and to Elsa. Uh, and this is such an important issue, everybody. So as Elsa said, I'm a prof in psychopharmacology. I've worked in drug discovery for psychiatry my whole career, which is coming up for 40 years. 
trying to develop better treatments for severe psychiatric illness. So for addictions, for depression, PTSD, anxiety, panic, disorders that are, are hard to treat and for which um, there's a, a huge need for better treatment. And I was an animal researcher and I ran my own company out of the university <clears throat> testing new treatments developed by big pharma, small pharma, biotech. And this, the really sad truth of all this is that in all that time, we never developed a medicine that made it into patients, that made a difference to patients' lives. And as Elsa said, we have a mental health crisis and that's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Your suicide rate through the roof, highest rate of drug-related deaths. This is a crisis and this is urgent. And the treatments that the psychiatrists have available to them are, are essentially very similar to the treatments that were discovered serendipitously in the 1950s. So that's over 70 years. So the so-called SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, to treat depression, they're used also to treat anxiety. The antipsychotics that we're using today, they're essentially based on the same brain mechanisms as those original medicines. So in terms of innovation in psychiatry, you know, we, we really haven't come very far. And people with mild to moderate mental illness can respond well to these drugs, but that leaves two thirds of the population and people with severe mental illness untreated. And there now, we, with, the, with all the work going on, and I guess we've kind of always known this because of the use of psychedelics by indigenous people, cannabis, plant medicines, for thousands of years, for spiritual purposes, for healing. I guess we've always known the potential healing power of psychedelics. So we're talking about psilocybin, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms that grows all around us, everywhere. Um, DMT, which is the active ingredient of ayahuasca, which is made by the Banisteriopsis vine in South America. So it grows naturally. And Hoffman made synthesized LSD in 1938. <coughs> he worked for Sandals, big pharmaceutical company. They could clearly see there was potential for this new drug, but they didn't know what for. So it was distributed widely to psychiatrists, psychologists, people who could work with it, with patients. And there were a number of research studies published in the 50s and the 60s, and of course, it all got shut down by the Nixon administration in the 70s. And all psychedelics got put into Schedule 1 uh, of the UN Convention and uh, were considered to be Class A drugs. But the, the, the results of the clinical trials in those days for addictions, for the existential anxiety and depression that occurs with getting a, a terminal diagnosis, cancer diagnosis, other disorders, We've all met people, my mother died of pancreatic cancer, we've all known people who've died um, in fear, in pain. And the, the psychedelics have enormous um, benefit for people at that stage of their life. Um, Humphrey Osmond treated 2,000 people with um, alcohol use disorder with LSD. Between, 19, between the 50s and the 70s, and he got a 45% abstinence rate. In Alcoholics Anonymous, the success rate is 7.5%. So, you know, we can only dream of having a medicine this, this good, and it's here. So, it got shut down, and with the psychedelic renaissance that started in the late 90s, and this, this started because of the, the people like David Nutt, like Rick Doblin. Um, Bill Richards, you know, they never gave up. They were there at the time. They knew the potential. It all got shut down from them, but they never gave up. 
but the struggle that they've had to get any research going um, is com has been completely unnecessary, and that's because of the scheduling. So Schedule 1, and we're all bound by the Misuse of Drugs Act, um, that has caused so much harm and, and has got us to this horrendous situation. The definition is that there's no medical therapeutic benefit, and we know we know from all the trial data, we, we always knew, I guess, that that's not correct. So it should never have been put in Schedule 1. So just to put this into context, people like me who want to research um, drugs like... Um, psychedelics or, or any um, psychoactive drug, we have a research exemption for anything that's outside of Schedule 1. So we can research heroin, cocaine, phencyclidine, ketamine, um, drugs that are potentially a lot more harmful than psychedelics. And the cupboards in my lab were full of it. I used phencyclidine as the model in the animals. My cupboards were full of it. And NHS is full of these drugs because they have medicinal potential. We have an exemption. We are allowed to hold them. And, you know, we're academics. We know what we're doing. We, the universities are full of dangerous chemicals. And they don't go missing. And we don't have accidents with them. Um, we're very carefully inspected and controlled. So one of the issues for us is that it's very confusing for us and it's easy to break the law by having something that's a derivative um doi for example is a 2a agonist it's schedule one i mean it, it doesn't make any sense there's no scientific basis for where these drugs sit and the research is very very difficult to do so the the uk home office stance is that you can do this research all you need to do is get a controlled drugs license. Well, that's from the Home Office. Well, that's true, but the Home Office are understaffed. It costs a lot of money. You have to be inspected. You have to have locked alarmed cabinets. You have to have somebody qualified to dispose of the drugs. It took me a year. And I'm in Manchester University. It's one of the bigger ones, um, very well funded. It took me a year to get my controlled drugs license. The form is impenetrable. The least they could do is make it a simple form. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of stigma, and it cost me a lot of money. It must have cost 6000 out of my research budget to get all the cabinets in place. You have to pay every year to have it renewed. But that's, I'm an animal researcher. What about if you want to do a clinical trial? So James Rucker down in London, um, every place you have the drug, every building has to have its own controlled drugs license. So he had six different locations where the drug was blinded, where it was um, manufactured, all those um, places he had to pay for the, the license. It took years to get the research going and it cost him at least 25,000 before he was able to, to get a drug into a patient in his clinical trial. And for David Nutt, for the first imperial trial, it took him two years to get permission. So the Home Office said you have to have ethics, ethics said you have to have the controlled drugs license. So he's just going around the same. He had a three year, MR, the first MRC grant ever for psychedelic research, and it was two years out of the three years. So it doesn't make any sense. And what we're asking is for us to have an exemption um, for the, the Schedule 1 restrictions, um, which I, you know, I think should be a, a relatively straightforward ask. And I just want to read you. I'm, I'm nearly. I have nearly finished. I just want to read you out a quote because I decided to do some research, um, qualitative study, talking to academics about their difficulties with the Schedule One status and um, whether it 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 was easy for them or whether it had an, an impact. And this is a, a quote. So it's only very, 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 very select people that have the potential to do Schedule One research. <coughs> And you know the workforce. It's kind of like so many barriers have been put up that you have to be a very specific few. You have to be particularly famous and have, you know, loads of grants and loads of philanthropy money behind you that they're willing to chuck millions at you. And it's an unavailable thing. So what we find is that people in smaller institutions will not do this research. Uh, a colleague of mine wanted to do... Um, 
in vitro epilepsy work with cannabis. He couldn't. He couldn't get controlled drugs license. So the scheduling is stopping people doing this work. Um, and it's really, really important that we change that. So that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thanks, Joe. I think that's one of the most important messages about rescheduling. There is plenty of research work to be done. Uh, we need to expedite that research work, get it started and uh, completed as soon as possible so that we can gain a bigger picture about past, current and future use of psychedelics in Scotland. And that would require the rescheduling. Yeah. That would require lobbying of Westminster. Yes. Um, so it's very, very important. Thanks, Joe. So we're going to move on to Dr. Murad Wahba, who is from, uh, come up from the University of Newcastle. And he is a specialist registrar in psychiatry and has been running some of the clinical trials um, with the Compass Pathways Group. And he's going to talk about some of the clinical trial results that have been going on. Thank you very much, Elsa. Good evening, everyone. Um, and it's nice to see uh, some faces from earlier today. Nice to see you again. I hope uh, you uh, find some nuance in uh, this time when we talk about things. Um, I come to this talk um, as a psychiatrist as, and somebody who is interested in consciousness in general. Um, I am a psychiatry registrar, so I'm almost done with my training. <clears throat> I've been working for the NHS for about 10 years now. And I did a little bit of psychiatry in Egypt before coming here. So I. Um, I have seen my fair share of people who are struggling with depression, anxiety, uh, substance misuse, uh, difficulties with drinking, with drugs, um, both in my personal and in my professional life. You know, I don't think mental illness escapes anybody. It is in all of our families, all of our friends, and it, uh, it's, it's no um, mystery or it's no uh, surprise that it's kind of at the very forefront of, um, of, the, of the health, health crisis at this point. Um, my, I mean, I came here around eight years ago with, with an interest in psychedelic therapy and <clears throat> because I really can't find anything that's more interesting to think about or to, 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 to use as a treatment um, as these um, substances, um, all of them. Um, there's a few that work in different ways and the really interesting thing is that they are a marriage of um, substance and psychotherapy. And this is something that doesn't really happen very often. There's, all, there's sometimes there's a divide between talking or psychological therapies and, and medications, but the way uh, we interact with these substances is that there is one or two administrations over a long period of time, but with a lot of work in between. And what we have been finding over the past 10 years, and we have come so far over the past 10 years. When I was first turned on to this, maybe in 2012, it would have been a far, far dream to be sitting in a room like this, to be talking about the research that's going on right now. I can't believe that uh, just two years ago, we finished a study that had 260 people who were randomized to one of three doses of psilocybin, which is the uh, active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Um, we are at the forefront of um, MDMA potentially becoming a treatment for, for PTSD. And this is despite of the um, incredible hurdles that people have to go through to get these substances um, to, to study. And it's a real shame um, because of exactly that you have to be a very special and specific kind of person to get this license because you have to really know that it works and want to work with it so much that you're willing to push past that. And we lose so many incredibly gifted and very smart and very talented people who can take us further than we would go ourselves if we were to study these substances. And I mean, just part of why I find them so fascinating. So let's take psilocybin, for example. Psilocybin is, is the drug found in magic mushrooms. People take that and their entire mode of consciousness changes. The way they see the world, the way they view themselves, the way they connect with themselves um, completely changes. Their thoughts change, their emotions change. Um, if we think about if your self has, um, for example, a, a job of keeping you safe from your internal difficulties, that is completely taken away. So people can be faced with things that they've been stowing away for years, but have been coming up 
as symptoms. And people describe this. They describe having really vivid memories. They describe having um, thoughts that they never thought they would have had before. And they come out, some of them come out really well, and that's what they need, and they're well for six months to a year. Some of them come out find having had a difficult experience, and it takes them perhaps six months, a year, but eventually they, um, a lot of the people that use them seem to get to a place where they wouldn't get on their own. Um, another equally interesting one is MDMA, for example. MDMA, you will have heard about it, it's, uh, it's uh, colloquially called ecstasy, or it's, it's in the pills that are colloquially called ecstasy. And what MDMA does is really interesting. So what they're using it uh, for now is for post-traumatic stress disorder. And for people who know a little bit about it, um, they'll know that one of the hardest things to do is to face the trauma that happened. So what happens when somebody's faced with an overwhelming trauma is that the brain doesn't process it in time fully. And so it comes back as nightmares, as flashbacks, as really intense anxiety, as a real a strong urge to avoid any situation that reminds a person with the trauma, and it takes over, it completely takes over. A lot of people go into addictions, a lot of people take their own lives, sadly, and one of the biggest hurdles is being able to go back and talk through this trauma. Now, with MDMA, for example, it's an uh, incredible drug. What it does is it keeps people's lucidity, so it keeps people engaged and aware, but it takes down their fear response. So what happens is what we call the window of tolerance, which is basically the space where somebody is in, where they can think through something without being overwhelmed or numb, which is usually what happened. People are either overwhelmed or numbed because it's too much. So they can actually go through the experience once again, and they can revisit it in a way that they hadn't been able to revisit it before. And because of its effects on oxytocin, prolactin, serotonin, people feel an empathy and a compassion towards themselves, and even sometimes towards their abusers, that would have taken ages for them to reach it otherwise, if at all. So they are really incredible substances, and if for nothing else, just for their interest in how they interact with our brains, and how they change the way we view ourselves and we view reality, why it's so hard to study them is just really, it's, it's so difficult to understand. When you do have access to things like heroin, um, ketamine, fencyclidine, which is PCP, by the way, for people who are not sure what it is, you know, it's angel dust, which, you know, I think we've all heard uh, horror stories about that. Um, all, all this does, I think, is just take us away from, from a new way of understanding different types of mental illness, different treatments, even our own consciousness and what it means to, to be human. Um, one of the most interesting uh, studies, in my opinion, for example, when they're looking at psilocybin is for people who are facing their own death. So people who are, uh, have a cancer diagnosis, for example, and they, are going, they know that it's going to be terminal in six months, eight months, and they are finding it very hard to come to terms with this death and the anxiety and the the depression that they're struggling with is making it very hard for them to enjoy their lives or what's left of it. Having one or two experiences seems to change this so significantly that they've opened up a special access program in Canada for people to be able to access this as they're reaching their death. So some people are being turned on to us. Australia, Canada, Portugal are, are, are reducing their laws. Uh, some states um, in the United States as well are going to decriminalization. So, you know, this is one of the most advanced countries in the world, you know, and this is a place where people like me come from other countries to study and to learn. And why we're falling behind on this crucial matter is really something that um, I'm finding difficult to, to understand. So if we can take anything from today, I, I hope that through our conversations and conversations with people who have, who have had their own healing journeys, that we, we rethink the way we think about these substances and make it just a little bit easier for us to be able to look at them in a way that would help us and, and just others around us. And I think that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Murad. That was a very um, thorough uh, overview of what's going on with clinical trials. I think it's, it's very important that we um, talk about how many indications there are for psychedelic use. Um, there are dozens and dozens of trials that are ongoing. I'm sure you could list off 
10, if not 20 indications uh, off the top of your head. Um, I've seen some for chronic pain, anorexia, uh, you know, some, some really quite troubling conditions that uh, affect so many people worldwide. So the potential is enormous. Yeah, huge. Lovely. Thank you very much, Moran. No um, so we're moving on to Jake, who is sat at the end. Jake is a co-founder of the Scottish Psychedelics Research Group. And he's also a specialty registrar in psychiatry. And Jake is based in Edinburgh, and he's just going to talk about um, the situation in Scotland from a psychiatrist's perspective. <coughs> cool. Uh, thank you, Ilsa. Um, yeah, so my name's Jake. Um, I am a psychiatrist working in addictions in Scotland. And in short, um, I'm in search of better tools to work with. Um, I could probably leave things there, but I'll expand a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I've been, been a doctor for about 10 years now. I've been working in mental health for about seven years. I've been working in addictions for the last sort of three, four years. That's my, that's my area. That's my specialty. And, um, yeah, I set up the, the Scottish Psychedelic Research Group with Anna and uh, Fiona and my friend Christoph, who's currently um, helping facilitate a psychedelic retreat in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, we set up a couple of years ago with, um, I guess, sort of with the intentions of not wanting to get left behind by England and the rest of the world. I felt a bit sort of sick and tired of seeing all the studies coming out of London and Bristol and Exeter and all these exciting psychedelic trials happening, but nothing, uh, nothing at all in Scotland. Um, I sort of <coughs> spoke, spoke with a friend about it and he said, surely in Scotland you'd be pushing against an open door with your, your drug and alcohol problems, but it's not really um, panned out that way. Um, so yeah, we set up a couple of years ago with the intentions of starting, well, I guess community building, gathering people from across mental health, um, academia, people with lived experience, uh, to try and essentially start a, start a community, start a movement here, and with the sort of, with the express goal of um, setting up a clinical trial, which we're still some ways away from, sadly, um, as you know, Joanne laid out the barriers in terms of money, cost, home office license, but um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Um, so yeah, why did I choose to go into psychedelics or why did I sort of choose this path? I think, um, yeah, in, in psychiatry, some of the drugs that we work with are SSRIs, mood stabilizers and um, antipsychotics. And I mean, not to belittle my profession too much but a lot of the times I think that you could probably teach someone how to be a psychiatrist in about sort of four to six months really it's just a lot of guesswork sort of chuck this medication at someone hope that hope that it works and it's really a lot of um I don't know I think I think it's not unfair to describe psychiatry as a palliative profession we sort of we treat symptoms we palliate people but we very rarely sort of cure people, that's not a word we use in psychiatry. We, we don't tend to cure people, we don't tend to sort of see healing, that's not a word we use in psychiatry either. As Murad was saying and jo Joanna was mentioning, I think that what psychedelic assisted therapy can offer people is a chance to sort of get to the, get to the roots of, well for me it's addiction I work with, get to the roots of their addiction and um, in my experience that's primarily trauma. Um, it's people with PTSD, it's people with complex PTSD, it's people with childhood neglect, abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and the vast majority of the people I see are are drinking, are using drugs to self-medicate, to press that down, to sort of to, to block that out, to numb it out. And I mean, people describe it as a maladaptive way of coping. I think that's quite an adaptive way of coping. I think I'd probably do the same if I was if that was my background. So yeah, I think that psychedelics offer something new and I think that in Scotland we have the we have the workforce, we have a, the skill set. We've got a, a trauma informed workforce. We've got we've got prescribers, we've got psychotherapists, we've got skillful sort of holistic practitioners from across a range of different areas within mental health and out with mental health. That I think that with 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 not a huge amount of training, I think it's possible to sort of upskill our workforce to be able to effectively and safely work with psychedelics. Um, you know, there are risks, there are risks to any medication. Whenever I speak with someone about starting on a, an SSRI, an antidepressant, I have to risk someone about, I have to warn someone about the risk of suicide. You know, these medications can, in, in rare cases, increase the risk of suicide. And 
these are not necessarily safe medications that we're working with. There's, there's risk to any intervention, there's risk to any medication. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that with psychedelics, we, we, ha we, ha we have a chance to offer something different and a, a chance to help people, I guess, help people cure, help people heal. And um, yeah, I think that in Scotland, we've got pretty much the worst drug-related death totals in the world pretty much the worst alcohol-related deaths and alcohol-related disease in the world. I think that it's foolish to not try something new. Um, you know, we're, we've ro proudly rolled out the MAT standards, the medication-assisted treatment standards, the year before last, and essentially it's more of the same. It's, you know, it's, it's methadone, it's getting people on opiate replacement therapy, and then we sort of come up against a bit of a brick wall. So, like, we've got some unstable methadone, they've stopped them from using heroin, and then what? The people's... There's probably people in here with lived experience of addiction or that know people that have um, used addiction services in Scotland and we're limited, we're highly limited in our options and um, yeah, I think that in short we, <laughs> we need better tools and psychedelic assisted therapy is one of them. Um, we've got a lot of skillful practitioners in this panel and in this, in this room and yeah, I think that it's something that Scotland should be looking at so um, yeah, that's basically all I have to say today. So. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jake. Um, it's obviously heartening to hear that there's somebody so passionate about addiction, which is clearly a very big problem in Scotland. Uh, I think one of the things I would like to mention is how valuable having somebody like a health economist look at the risk benefits and the cost benefits that you might get <coughs> from being able to implement um, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy in those sorts of communities. Um, because obviously, you know, they are, um, they use a lot of the um, medical facilities, but also the so social care facilities as well. So um, yeah, thank you, Jake. So we're moving on to the second part, uh, which is sort of discussing a little bit more about lived experience. Um, so lived experience uh, refers to people who have used psychedelics or have been on a psychedelic journey. Um, so to my left is Rory Lamont, who is an ex-Scotland rugby player, um, a formidable character. We ha we've heard his story a couple of times this week, but actually I'm not tiring of it. I think uh, Rory has been on an incredible journey um, that started uh, several years ago. Um, with a very difficult period of um, injuries. So, Rory, I'll hand over to you to tell us about your healing journey. Thank you. Thank you. So, I had a 10-year career um, and uh, ticked all the boxes, played at two World Cups, 29 caps, would have had more, but uh, I was navigating the dark side, which is a lot of injuries. Uh, surgeries after surgery, um, about 15 surgeries over my 10-year career, 12 knockouts as well, knocked unconscious, 12 times, many more concussions on top of that. And when I was 29 years old and I got a career-ending injury, a broken leg that wouldn't heal, um, everything came crashing down for me. And not long after that, I had to have more surgery on my broken leg um, and I got an infection in the surgical wound and I was put on antibiotics. And uh, immediately after the antibiotics, my digestive system stopped working. Um, and so I was in this situation where I'm trying to navigate my premature retirement from the, the one thing that I de de dedicated my life to. Um, and I was also navigating a, a huge health crisis where my digestive system just stopped working. I couldn't struggle to feed myself, couldn't digest food. I was struggling to walk. So I would, couldn't eat, couldn't walk, stuck at home, mourning the loss of my career, my way of life, um, mourning the loss of my, my future because I couldn't see a way forward. How can you, how could I move on when could barely feed myself, losing huge amount of weight, four stone in four months. Doctors had no answer for what was going on. Um, I was in a real, real crisis. Um, deep depression, 
followed suit. Navigating really intense physical health issues with my digestive system and many more other symptoms. Um, heart palpitations, muscle spasms, bloodshot eyes, insomnia. I was in a physical health crisis and also a deep emotional crisis. Um, just wondering how the hell had my life gone so wrong. Uh, a year before I was you know, flying high, representing Scotland in the Six Nations, uh, representing my country, you know, you know, manifesting my childhood dreams. And uh, suddenly here I was just in this horrendous position, lost my way of life, lost my job, lost my friends, lost my future, um, and just stuck with no help, no support. Scottish Rugby Union had cut all medical support um, and I was on my own, cut adrift. And it was, the, the betrayal I felt was so painful. Um, yeah, the, the emotional pain that I was experiencing on top of the physical pain was almost unbearable. And I was stuck in this position for quite a long time, a year and a half. Um, and it was getting to the point where I couldn't see a way forward, I couldn't see a way out of my situation. And I was at the stage where I was, if this continues for much longer, I'm going to have to take my own life because this is un unbearable. And uh, I was hoping for some kind of intervention, someone to come rescue me. And uh, you know, for a long time, nothing, nothing was coming until I heard um, a guy called Aubrey Marcus speaking on the Joe Rogan podcast. This is in uh, October 2014. And he was speaking about his experience with the plant medicine Iboga, which is a very powerful African plant medicine that is used for uh, spiritual healing, emotional healing, and also for, for drug uh, addiction. And, and many other, there's many, many benefits to it. But when I heard Aubrey speak about it, I knew in my heart, there's a full body knowing that this, this was a tool that was gonna help me get out of my situation. And so within a couple of weeks, I managed to get myself out to Costa Rica. And in 10 days at the uh, retreat center that I was attending, I had three doses, three ceremonial, uh, three ceremonies with, with this plant medicine. After the first night, my suicidal ideation was turned off my depression was alleviated. After the second uh, ceremony, I had a blueprint, uh, a vision for my future hope returned and I could see a way out of my, what felt like before an impossible situation. Um, and it, with that hope, uh, my, my, meaning to life started to, to return. I'd like, I could see a reason to live. And from that moment onwards, I really, it, my, my challenges that I was facing were still there. Nothing changed in my outer reality. I was still having the, the health, physical health issues. But I was blessed with this, like knowing that I could get through it and that I could see a way where I couldn't see a way forward before. I could now see a path through the challenges and that the thought of taking my, my own life at this stage now seemed absurd. But I'd been in that state for, for a very long time. And, um, you know, part of my journey was when I was in that state of like, in that horrendous like situation, you know, as I said, the doctors didn't have an, have an answer. You know, just they, they wanted to write my, my issues off as purely a, a mental health issue. And, uh, you know, part of, part of my problem that I'd got me into this mess was my overexposure to pharmaceutical drugs, pop and painkillers, anti-inflams, opioids, exposure to anesthetics, taking these things every day for, for many, many years, for over a decade. And so the thought of running to a doctor to get antidepressants, more pharmaceutical drugs, I knew that wasn't an option. 
And here came into my life a natural plant medicine that works in harmony with, with the body. And it completely transformed my, my outlook of my life, my situation. It gave me insight about the, the wounds, my, my childhood wounds that I carried, deep emotional understanding of the forces that had contributed to my deep unhappiness. And through that awareness of the wounds that I carried as well, integrating these wounds into my, my conscious awareness, I was no longer like haunted by the wounds of like rejection and pain that I'd gone through, the wounds of betrayal that I'd experienced. And so I wasn't, I was no longer bound by the past, the pain of the past. And I just had all this optimism to, to look forward, to see a way and to, to cultivate a, a new life for myself. And it, you know, it, the problems didn't disappear, but my whole perspective of my life and who I was and the, the strength I had within me had been, had been lifted. And from that point onwards, that was just the beginning of my healing journey, working with natural therapies, breath work, meditation, uh, nutritional therapy, but I also connected with the indigenous tribes who work with these medicines with ayahuasca, spent time in Colombia and in uh, Peru and deepened my, my healing, my journey, tapping into the indigenous wisdom and their, their powerful plant medicines, their healing medicines that were deepening my healing and bringing more love and more joy into my life. And I feel blessed that I was in a position to be able to afford to spend the tens of thousands of pounds that it cost to get out to South America and into uh, Costa Rica. Whereas here, there's thousands upon thousands of people, men and women who are struggling, who are hundreds every year taking their life because they're in so much emotional pain and, and, and so much suffering. They don't, and they're not in a position to be able to spend tens of thousands traveling to foreign lands to connect with plant medicines that heal. And that's a, a, a travesty that people's healing is out of their reach. And we have an opportunity in this country to change the legal status of the plant medicines that are showing incredible, incredible results for healing depression, for helping people <coughs> navigate the challenges that they're facing. So. Every day that passes that these substances can't be researched and are out of reach of the masses, we're losing lives unnecessarily. And I've no doubt that my life would be in a very different position if I hadn't been able to connect with these, these medicines. And I, I really feel that these medicines, these plant medicines have saved my life. So I just want to, anyone who's listening to understand we need to change, we need to change the, the, the laws, we need to reschedule them so that they can be researched and that they can become accessible. So thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rory. That was a very powerful testimony that you gave there. I think um, I'm going to reinforce one of the um, points that I find most poignant, which is that um, we need rescheduling of uh, the psychedelics in order to enable not just research into pharmaceutical compounds, but also research into the natural um, indigenous species that we have in Scotland that have powerful healing properties. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us, Rory. Um, so I'm going to move on to a fellow board member of the Scottish Psychedelic Research Group. And this is John Anderson, and he's going to tell his own um, personal story of lived experience with bipolar disease and um, psychedelics. Thank you. So I'm a neuroscientist as well, and I also work as a therapist, as an integration therapist, so I support people <coughs> that had their own psychedelic experiences and journeys. I've had bipolar all my life, 
And also, this is the first time that I'm sharing my story, so I'm going to try not to get emotional about it. When I was 11 years old, I was brutally raped. I told nobody. And I held that trauma in until my mid-twenties, I think, when I had my first psychotic episode. I then tried to end my life three times over the course of the next few years. Fortunately, I didn't succeed. Caused immense pain and suffering, not just to me, but to the people I loved in my life, my family, my friends. I was sectioned at one point and traumatized further because I was restrained physically and forcibly injected with something. I think it was a sedative because I lost consciousness fairly quickly <coughs> afterwards. Um, lots of psychiatric medication to manage my bipolar. Some of it helped for a while, but also I lost a lot of other things in that process. I lost my creativity. Um, I felt like, an, uh, like a robot often. And I think I got to a point in life uh, in my 40s where I think I just couldn't go on anymore. I remember walking towards, uh, walking home, and there was a rail line. And I thought, that's it, I'm done, I'm gonna check out. I just can't go on like this anymore. I went up to the train line, I knelt down, I broke down in tears by the side of the train line, and I thought, I'm just gonna put my neck on the line, I'm gonna wait for the next train to come along. I thought of all of the people that love me, I said goodbye to every single one of them. I thought of the train driver and the impact it was going to have on them. And somewhere inside of me, some part of me, remembered the <coughs> early stage clinical trial that had been done by Imperial. And I thought, come on, John, you're a neuroscientist, surely you can... Can you find a way? Is this a last ditch attempt? Can you try this? Is this going to work for you? I didn't want to end up taking something that I thought, you know, is possible. Could have, I could have had a manic episode from that because I'd already had plenty of that in my life. And I should say up to that point, I'd had psychosis once, at least once, every year of my life. Can you imagine how damaging that would be, not just for me, but for the loved ones, for my wonderful wife, who did her best to support me through many of those episodes. Through my family, who were just at their wit's end, didn't know how to manage that situation. So I took a leap of faith, and I thought, well, I'm gonna try this myself. Ever being the scientist, I thought, well, I'll set this up as close to a clinical trial as possible. In the circumstances, I had psychological support. There was somebody that I had agreed that I would speak to, a therapist who was comfortable with me talking about the experiences. And I decided to try it for myself. I was terrified. And it came from a point of pure desperation because I didn't see how I could have a future anymore. I just couldn't live with the trauma, with the pain. And every time I tried to talk about it previously, I would become re-traumatized and feel suicidal afterwards. And there was no end to that process for the best part of two decades. The first time I ever tried it, um, therapeutically, it's no understatement to say it changed my life. There's two clear messages I had from that. The first one was, damn, dude, you didn't, you, you didn't understand as much about the mind as you thought you did, as a neuroscientist. The second one was meeting my younger self, who was traumatized. And it was like there was, there was some entity who I thought might have been some version of myself in the future. And that was kind of holding like a safe space for me. And they said, this is going to be really hard for you, but you need to go through this, you need to face it. And there was a younger me there, rigid with fear, traumatized, 
blood stained. And I had a dialogue with that person and I held them in my arms and I said, I'm so sorry you had to go through that, that we had to go through that, but you survived this because you became me. And at a certain point, I just felt all of the tension go and they just kind of absorbed into me. And then this other entity or whatever it was, however you want to conceptualize it, some part of myself um, said, yeah, it's a kicker dude, isn't it? It said, this is just the first part of your journey. You need to go to therapy now because you're pretty fucked up. You need to go to therapy and you need to work this process through. So I came back from that process feeling that I'd experienced some really deep healing, but knowing that there was a lot of work yet to do. So I did, I went to therapy, I got, that was hard in itself, but it was also a part of my healing journey. I had subsequent journeys, which also tackled other aspects of the trauma that I'd experienced. And over time, I came to a different relationship with it. And one day I decided to train as a therapist myself because I wanted to, other people to experience the healing that I had. <clears throat> so one of the things I do now is I support people with bipolar in that context. And I think about it. What if I hadn't have taken that leap of faith and I had actually gone through and ended my life? Not only would it have had a devastating impact for my family, for the people who love me, but all of the people that I've managed to help since. Maybe they wouldn't have got help. I like to think they would. But that wouldn't exist if I hadn't have found a way to heal myself. And I should never ever be in a situation where one has to choose between their own life self-preservation, their mental well-being and not being a law-abiding citizen under the laws of this country. You should never be putting people in that situation. So my hope is that not only can we have greater inclusion so that people like me can get access to the help that is needed, desperately needed, and I should say that in most clinical trials, the recent one by Compass Pathways excluded, um, people like me are locked out of this. We are excluded from clinical trials. Nobody wants to help us. Why? Personally, I think sometimes it's because they're too worried about their grant funding. Or they say to me, oh, well, we, want to do, we don't want to do further harm. Well, by doing nothing, harm happens. So what I would like to see is diversity so that people like me can get the help that they need. But I would also like to work towards a future maybe where one day we can go out, we can connect to nature, we can harvest our own medicines, and we can bring them back and use them in legal ceremony in a meaningful way. That's the future I would like to see. So thank you for listening. John, incredibly brave to choose the Scottish Parliament to uh, speak to about a very deeply personal experience. You clearly feel very strongly that this is um, a healing journey that others need to also embark on in your position. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're going to move to my right. We have Karen Llewellyn. Uh, Karen is the mother of two sons who has, um, I think it would be fair to say, had a struggle over the years dealing with drug-related issues, not her own, but those of her sons. And actually, Karen has a very personal experience um, where she herself has turned to psychedelic therapy, and she's going to tell us that story. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> John, I thought I was going to know what I was going to talk about tonight until I heard your story, and it's just totally changed completely. So... Um, 
before my children were born, I was a conductor on ScotRail. And in 1994, a gentleman stood in front of my train. And the only thing I know about that man is that his name was Joe and he had bipolar disorder. And off the back of that happening, my husband and I decided to start a family. And Daniel was born in October 1995. And then Jake came along in May 1997. And my son Jake has bipolar disorder. And to be sitting here on a panel like this, it just feels like serendipity to me. Um, this is just magic. So thank you for sharing your story. And I'm so glad that you're still here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, what I want to say is it's, I'm going to use the words of Krishnamurti, it's no measure of good health to be well adjusted in a profoundly sick society. Yeah. My sons have had a spiritual allergic reaction to the toxic world that we live in. <laughs> so... <clears throat> We tried to get help for Daniel when he was in primary school. And Cam's told us that he wasn't severe enough. <laughs> but fast forward to, was he severe enough when he went to prison? Was he severe enough when he went to cash stairs for six weeks? Was he severe enough when he spent a year in a, a rehab mental health ward? So at what point do we go upstream and help people. And this is my problem with the medical model. It's not helping. So we have to do something different. And if we don't get the help from the state, we'll do it ourselves. I'm not asking for permission and I am not asking for forgiveness from anybody to get the help that we need. So, <clears throat> the trauma that we have taken on board as a family, as a community, um, we are beginning to realise it's on us to fix it. Nobody's coming to help us. So I think what's happening in spaces like this and what we can take forward out into the world is just so important. So to be here tonight, and, and I mean no disrespect to anybody here that, that works in the medical model. I, I, I know there's a lot of people that are doing their best, but it needs to change and it needs to change so rapidly because we are in a, such a serious crisis with mental health and addiction. And I think we've reached tipping point now. We've reached tipping point. We're in emergency mode. So, yeah. I, I can't think of what else to say, but John, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you, Karen. That was definitely a mother's story there. Um, I think one of the most valuable things you pointed out there is um, that we need to do things differently. Whatever we're doing is not working currently. So we now need to come up with solutions and we come up with solutions as a society. We shouldn't need to come up with solutions as individuals. This is a societal problem. Well-being affects everybody. So um, yeah, thank you, Karen, for sharing that. So we've come to the end of our um, panel time and I'd like to put out to the floor for questions. 
Oh, Anna, straight away. Um, the, uh, you need to wait for a microphone. Chuck it over. It was just really to follow up on um, you, Karen, because um, I was wondering if you could speak to us just a little bit about the role of psychedelics and healing the trauma in families yes. um, in regards to sort of problematic um, substance use, like yes. you know, okay. substance use that can cause issues. So, I kind of yeah. went off beam there, didn't I? No, it's It's just a so the role in psychedelics and, and, and healing families, I think um, I, I think what I would like to see, I, I don't know if my husband would ever be up for this, but I would like to see whole families going through this together. Um, because I think the great thing about my experience that's taught me with psychedelics is that it, there's no need to feel the fear that to sit with that level of pain you don't feel that fear. You just sit with it. I mean, the second trip that I did when I, I was sitting with my grief for my friend who passed away in 2018, there was so much joy attached to it at the same time. And it's just part of life. That pain is part of life. And you've just got to lean into it and accept it as part of the human experience. So, yeah, I would like... For for my, you know, footsteps to be followed by you guys. So, yeah, yeah. Mm. Sorry about this gun, um, or anybody's experienced trauma. Um, the first time you came back around your anniversary, and you realized it wasn't going to be like it had always been. Can you just briefly describe how that feels? What do you realize it's not going to slam into you that hard that you? You don't have to answer if you don't want to, because I know it's hard and painful. So I find, am I right in thinking that you, you want me to kind of reflect on where I am now? Just uh, the general sense of feeling, if it makes sense, when yeah. you realize the anniversary is approaching. Oh, I see. But it is yes. no longer the old anniversary, if you kept yeah. going. Well, personally, I, I separate my life into my life before psilocybin mushrooms and my life after. Um, that's the only anniversary, really, that I kind of really think about because everything up until that point was shit, to be honest. Um, not only because of the trauma, uh, but after psilocybin mushrooms, it was... I could regulate my emotions better. I was able to have a greater degree of insight into my health and what I needed to do to stay well. Um, and I've been psychosis free for over seven years. Not once since then have I had psychosis. That's a game changer for me. That's been incredible. I could never have done the level of training that I've done subsequently if I'd had psychosis every year. So the impact is, you know, and that's just for me, but never mind the impact that that's had for my family and the people who love me. The fact that I have a wonderful, loving wife and family and that they feel they've got somebody back who they, they love as well from that. And it also means that I can be there to support them now in a way that I never was able to before because I was too busy firefighting with my own crap. So, yeah, when the anniversary comes around, I put a little kind of um, rose on, on my, my uh, altar, I call it, as kind of remembrance. And I just say thank you so much to the universe for for the opportunity, for the fact that these medicines grow. And also to myself thinking, thank God you had, you know, you, you, you took that leap of faith because without it, it could have been very different. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you especially to the panelists that came out and spoke openly about psychedelic use. I think the more of us that talk openly about that and <coughs> the psychedelic user, 
um, and all the really school people and the world is one place, you know, for each of the panelists, we are now in Scottish Parliament, what do you want Scottish Parliament to do? <coughs> oh, I don't, I don't mind starting on that one. I think the obvious one is that we need MSPs to uh, lobby Westminster. Um, we can only change uh, access to good quality research if we um, reschedule the psychedelics. Um, and I think, uh, I think Anna will discuss this. We need cross-party working groups on psychedelics. Um, I also think that we need regular evidence updates and that might be, um, yeah, we, we, need, we need to be looking at what the other countries are doing. Why are they doing it? Why are they doing it first? What can we do to keep up with the developments? You know, if Australia are treating people with psychedelics and we know that it has good outcomes, why are we leaving people and their well-being and their health and their journeys um, until we reschedule. You know, I just think we should be expediting good quality research. Somebody else? We need funding. We need to lobby for, for funding for research. I think your MPs should be lobbying um, Westminster to make psychedelic assisted therapy legal um, and to decriminalise plants. That has made, had a very big impact in the States and has enabled them um, in various cities in the States to change their laws. This is urgent. Um, we need more research, we need funding, but we need to enable people to access this now. Uh, I'm happy to go next. So I would like to get to a point where uh, we integrate legally psychedelic assisted therapy into mainstream counseling and psychotherapy so that appropriately trained therapists can work with it because I think that adds greater flexibility and diversity because there is a diverse range of people who need it for different reasons. And they are the best population to be able to work with this, not just have it within the NHS system. So that's what I would like to see. Beyond that, I would like to see all plant medicines decriminalized so that people who want to use it in meaningful ceremonies for spiritual exploration and other things can do so without fear of imprisonment because we've lost contact with our own indigenous practices of shamanism, druidism, where these substances have been used for a long time um, so there is precedent for that. And the only way that we're going to get there is together. So I agree with the other panelists that we need to be, uh, we need MSPs to lobby Westminster to change the laws accordingly so that we can get this done and get people the support that is desperately needed. Um, I'm not going to add much to that, really. I think it's um, yeah, rescheduling se seems like just a no-brainer to me, really. Um, and I think decriminalization goes really closely with that, mainly, if nothing else, I mean, of course, to give the chance for people to um, experience it the way they would like to experience it. But for people who are already experimenting themselves and are already taking it, taking it, taking it upon themselves to explore their own consciousness, to have a place to go when they find themselves in a difficult situation. Because what we find happening now is that people can find themselves um, not finding the space to hold them after they've had the experience, which is, is really essential. So I think they go hand in hand. So yeah, that would be my, uh, my wish. I, I mean, I, I think most things have been said already, but you know, I would just be encouraging our politicians to just look at Portugal, right? Look at the transformation that country has gone through since decriminalizing uh, these substances. You know, it's turned into a, a health and, and wellness hub uh, of, of, of Europe and the, you know, all the, all the positive, the reductions in disease and, and deaths, HIV, um, <coughs> And just the, the tourism that's coming in, why, why, why can't we get Scotland 
like that. that, that that's, you know, Scotland is a magical, magical country. And uh, we are so blessed to, to be in this land and we can create such a, a beautiful space for people to experience healing. And the, you know, the, the culture is ripe for healing when there's so much suffering and trauma and pain that is within the Scottish population. It's, like, it's an act of compassion. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for all the, the, the pioneers here and uh, the scientists as well who are, who are doing this work and trying to push the, 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 the change in the, the legal status. But yeah, Scotland can be, become a, a beautiful haven of healing with these changes. I'd love to see that. Are there any more questions? Hi, I'm Paul Sweeney, member of Parliament for Glasgow. I'm also the Shadow Health Minister, Mental Health Minister to the Labour Party. Um, just one second, all out of curiosity this evening, but I've left very deeply inspired by what everyone has said tonight. Um, I guess my background with this would be I was involved in setting up the first unofficial overdose prevention centre in Glasgow in 2019. Um, my background was probably dealing with some of the poorest communities in Scotland, deprived communities in Scotland, and we're learning that drug use was largely an effort to try and medicate themselves and, and try and deal with deeply difficult circumstances. And that was only reaffirmed by my experiences on the overdose prevention facility, which was, a, you know, we weren't equipped really to deal with the deep trauma that people had, but nonetheless we were able to keep people alive, primarily who were using opioids. Um, but I think what you've shown tonight is there's a whole new dimension to how we can help people. Um, and for that, I'm very grateful for you to, to, to share that information. Um, I'm currently working on a member's bill um, on overdose, well, drug death prevention Scotland bill. Uh, and one of the big challenges we've got is legislative competence uh, within the Scottish Parliament to deliver that overdose prevention licensing framework. Um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of thinking going on about how we achieve that um, under the current devolved reserved competences. Um, and also how we've achieved things like heroin assisted treatment under the current restrictions. Um, so I would say there's probably a mechanism for us to look at how we can do this without necessarily having Home Office <laughs> explicit approval. Um, and actually you can prescribe anything really <laughs> clinically. Uh, you know, so let's look at how we innovate. Um, just say, please get in touch as a follow up and we can look at how we can use this bill as a way of trying to innovate in this space. But I hadn't any understanding really of how psychedelics could perform a role here that was deeply helpful to society. So thank you for that. Cheers. Thank you, Paul. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but we are about to call for some MSPs to sponsor a cross-party on psychedelic medicine. So it might be something you want to think about in, uh, sort of going forward. Cross-party groups certainly have a role. The biggest challenge in this parliament is getting enough people to be core for anything because <laughs> there's such competition for time. Um, there is already a cross-party group on mental health. There is already a cross-party group on uh, medicinal cannabis. So there might be opportunities to broaden the, the, the agenda or scope of those existing cross-party groups. So that's something we can discuss. I would also suggest as a mechanism to get parliamentary time to discuss this in more detail would be to utilise the Public Petitions and Citizens Participation Committee, which until recently I served as member of. Um, you only need one signature to trigger a petition. It's based on the quality of the petition. Um, I wouldn't frame it as something that's at risk of being say, you know, saying it's a reserve competence. I would put it as how does the NHS in Scotland develop this field? Um, and that's something that would open the door to this and being an inquiry that the Petitions Committee and the Health Committee could take forward. So and it's certainly something I would ha be happy to, and other MSPs would be happy to go along and, and sort of advocate for when it came to the committee. I would say that's actually probably more useful than a cross-party group because it can often just be talking shops that don't do anything. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Not, not to be rude about CPGs, but you know, it's actually more useful if you get a committee <laughs> doing something. Uh, there you go. No, that's fair enough. As, um, we've got the medicinal cannabis one, and it's true, you meet three times a year, but we have the Scottish Psychedelic Research Group that we've set up a year ago, and the whole point of that is to create this user voice and this voice that can then feed into a cross-party. Then, So the work gets done behind, and then effectively you're just meeting three times a year to make that campaign. But thank you so much for turning up. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Do we have any more questions? Or comments? 
Or comments. Excellent. Um, wonderful panel. I mean, really wonderful panel. Um, I was deeply moved by everything that was said and felt I could see you feeling each other. It was really beautiful. Um, man, thank you. Um, I, I hope there's. I hope that's given the strength to uh, another man in the room to to come forward for that. You know, often a lot of these suicides are down that that issue. You know, certainly a few of my attempts were. And I can't remember the first time I heard someone, a grown man, speaking about, about that, but it transformed uh, my, my, my life. So thank you for that. Um, something I'd just like to make sure, um, you know, because, you know, with legislation and whatnot, I, th I, think, I think what's integral in working with these medicines as a practitioner is that you work with them uh, as a participant. Uh, and I think I think the biggest impact could be made in this field if we uh, uh, a GoFundMe together and get some of these politicians over and some of these retreats that are going over in Holland. <laughs> I think that's potentially how we make a difference because it starts with the individuals. You know, it started with me. I'm, I'm uh, talking about this stuff and campaigning about this stuff all the time. Everybody I work with, it's, it's, that's what we're doing. You know, we're changing lives, um, and and often the people that rise to the top of narcissistic systems are the people that need our healing the most. Yeah. And, and quite often that's the politicians. I mean, just look around the world about who's, who's running us. Yeah. <laughs> that's not who's meant to be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. perhaps, perhaps, um, perhaps when we're building the infrastructure of what this is going to look like for professionals and for non-professionals, working with medicine is that we built into the infrastructure that they have to be working with medicine on a personal level. And they have to really not be doing much else. That needs to be their full job, you know. Uh, and that goes for politicians as well, uh, just to be clear. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name's Sam Holmes, and I'm on Farmers' Company for Change Group for Farmers Affected by Drugs and Alcohol. I also facilitate a global farmer support group for farmers affected by drugs and alcohol. I'm a mum with three adult addict children. And I've came to this event and other events that Fiona and Anna has uh, put on so that me as a mum with 65 years old understands what psychedelic drugs are. Because that's what it sounds like to us as parents. Drugs, so drugs means you can't take drugs, that's bad. I've had so bad experiences with addiction in my family. But I'm learning and I'm understanding what psychedelic means. So to get this over to the public, like me, a mommy, with three added children, and all my family support groups and families campaign for change here for the Highlands to the borders, you need to come in to the family group to make us understand what this medicine is going to do to heal us as families. Me as a mum, I'm going to go on a retreat and try it because I'm starting to realise the trauma I've had. And I'm now 65. I could have quite a good life for the rest of my life and my older years. And my family and all my friends and through the groups need to be educated to understand it. And I think that's a part, everybody that's taken part in the day and what I've listened to is absolutely amazing. I'm blown away by it. But you have to understand the normal Joe public family when you hear the word psychedelic drugs, because that's what comes into it. If we can start educating people and go around the family support groups, we've got a few for the Highlands to the borders. And I think, and I've invited people on a, a Zoom group on a Thursday night so we can reach more people and I would like to see that promoted that through today earlier on we were speaking to the we were preaching to the converted that's not the people we need to reach we need to reach the people that didn't understand and see how much healing psychedelics can do for families so I think that's another way forward and we need to start talking about it with families, no individuals, and being part of a group makes it even more widespread. 
So everybody's welcome to Families Campaign for Change or Midlothian Families Support Group to start spreading the word to the families. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. The panel was incredible. <clears throat> Great learning and hugely rich conversation. Uh, my background's in HIV activism, and the thing that's used as the excuse is stigma. I'm really interested, I think we acknowledge that decrim is critical, the need for solid evidence, you know, robust policy changes, and thank God MPs showing up to listen, um, and um, obviously underpinned by incredible personal, brave testimony, which pisses and everything as far as I'm concerned when it comes to the storytelling. But I think the thought, we live in a world of brands, and I think coming to the thing tonight, I thought I was coming to the psychedelic research gig, and it was the indigenous blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, and, and I think that's kind of really interesting to me. I'm really curious to see what the panel think about, in a world of clicks and echo chamber bullshit, how do we rebrand this to make it palatable to mammies and daddies and families? I mean, my background was you know, gay clubs and the ecstasy and ketamine generation and disco dancing. That was my introduction to it and a partner who lives with mental health challenges and has tried several potions, lotions and pills. And I think maybe looking at where we're branding this, so the tipping point that we're talking about, which will be achieved through the pillars of decrim and policy awareness and awareness and testimony and storytelling, which is critical to our culture. But the branding of it, I just wonder if there's a conversation about brand psychedelics as a medical, social, spiritual intervention for, for spiritual malady it might be interesting. How do we rebrand it? Any ideas? We don't rebrand, we learn from the great movements that came before us. So we learn from the HIV communities, we learn from the gay communities, and we learn from all the communities because drug policy reform is not about drug policy. It's about freedom. It's about freedom from stigma and it's about freedom from criminalisation. So we share the same oppressors and as long as we always remember that, then that's what keeps us not divided. I think the HIV movement's moving to away from using stigma as an excuse. Stigma's not cutting anymore. Creativity. I just think it would be interesting for this movement to maybe concentrate that's one of the mantras. So one of the things that the SBRG is really focused on, and I guess it's rebranding, but it's basically saying these medicines were used in our culture up until fairly recently in human terms, you know, up until the witches were burned. We've been using other plant medicines up until the 1970s as medicine. But if you're talking about psychedelics, where we're wanting, the thing that we're wanting to do in the SBRG is to not say this is a new medicine, Say this is something that was oppressed and was, you know, burnt and killed and murdered and, 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 and um, annihilated from our culture. So we're actually, all we're doing is reclaiming. I mean, most of us in Scotland spent our early Octobers, or not most, but many of us in Scotland <laughs> spent our early Octobers, you know, in the early morning sort of foraging for those little mushrooms. So we're talking about something that grows everywhere and so yes there is a, an idea about branding but I think what we really like to do is more just say this is part of us we're actually reclaiming our heritage as a way to heal you know the society that's been caused by Cartesian style neoliberal capitalism <laughs> fucking fuck the state <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> So I don't know if that, if that helps answer. Yeah. <laughs> and also, like the other movements, we get honest. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. you don't do that by hiding in the closet. You get, you get honest by coming out and saying, this is what I do for my own health. Can I say something about mine as well? Um, so I'm a, I'm a cannabis and psychedelics journalist, and so I write for mainstream. So that's exactly who I'm talking to, are the people who don't know anything about it. So we're to, you know, I, will write, I write for the Times and the Independent and the Mirror. So it's, to, it's the masses, you know. And, and while, yes, we do need to be talking about reclaiming and everything, really what, I mean, it's already happening, this rebranding. It's already happening. You've got this renaissance. It's suddenly become part of the wellness movement, and it's quite trendy, you know. So it's, it's coming out anyway. 
Um, and it's when you bring out into the, the mainstream these, these stories about the families and about you know, the, the parents, the mums, and the, the people who have suffered as children and the people who continue to suffer <coughs> as adults and what, what's going on there. That's what, that's what actually rebrands it because um, you know, at that point, you're not looking at it as a drug anymore. You are looking at it as a medicine. And, that's, and that's, that is already happening. So it's literally when you, you, it's the language you use to talk about it and it's the way you frame it. Um, and that's you know that's what I'm doing. That's what other people are doing in the mainstream. So it, it's happening. It's happening. But you're you're absolutely right. It's um, what you're saying about how, the language you use and you know the way things are titled and whatever. It's really important and key to it as well. Okay. Thank you. I'm just noticing. Oh, hello. Just noticing the time, and I think we need to be wrapping up. I wanted to say a really big thank you to Pauline McNeil for hosting this here. Hi, Pauline. <laughs> and um, yay! And this is this is a this is the final event of a series of three-day events, and we hope to be having more in the Parliament. Um, as we've said, as we've mentioned, we would really like some MSPs to consider setting up a cross-party on psychedelic me medicine. I know it's tokenistic, but the reality is, is if we have these elements, uh, Pauline, you missed that when P Paul was talking about the tokenism <laughs> element of the cross-parties. So there are other mechanisms. For those of you that haven't been involved throughout the rest of the groups, we'd love it if you can get involved with the SPRG. Yeah, we're going to get um, Pauline up here. But yeah, thank you. And also thank you to our speakers and all to, to our volunteers throughout the three days. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to pass over to Pauline. I'll just finally say that... Um, we're meeting at the Hollywood Tavern, uh, not Hollywood Tavern, uh, the Brass Monkey at half past eight, if anyone fancies a drink afterwards. Important things, you know. <laughs> Got to socialise, of course. Hey, Anna, as usual, uh, you and Fiona have provided, I think, some of the most amazing speakers we've had here in the Parliament. Really, really dynamic and interesting. Thank you so much um, for, for, for being here. Um, well, I'm already chairing the cross-party group on medicinal cannabis and a few others, so I will be happy to support it, but I can't take up an office bearer's position. But um, I think I'd like to see more discussion on this uh, topic. I mean, I suppose there's similarities with what we're trying to do with, uh, in the sense that we believe in the freedom of people to be able to uh, look after their well-being by getting access to whatever they think makes mm -hmm. their lives better. Mm -hmm. So that's the commonality, I think, between what you've been talking about and what we try to achieve. And mm -hmm. even though that it's it's uh, prescribable now, we've got so many hurdles to cross. And that's why having a parliamentary forum to try and break down some of those barriers is so important. Um, and I think... Um, if you're planning to do something else, um, I wish there was a few more MSPs here. I think me and Paul Sweeney have been the only two that have been here, but I know there's been a lot. Of, in fact, Colette Stevenson was also here um, and she had to go early, but I, I think there's a lot of interest in this subject and I hope another day, Anna, we can do uh, something else. But you and Fiona Gilbert, it's in just, just do fantastic work in recovering justice. Um, and what you bring here is really uh, unbelievable. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, so with that, we'll close the event, go and have a drink and uh, thank you very much for coming along. Connected to the spiritual antenna of the dearly missed Terence McKenna. Flaw of attraction. Four fractions of fractals fracturing into fragmented factions and their interactions with you and me. In this perfect symmetry of sacred geometry, there is no poetry that can reconcile me with my enemy because my enemy is me, I see. And how could I look at me kindly when I've been stumbling through this life so blindly, monochrome, torn, all alone, eyes wildly searching for something outside of me, trying to recover some broken shard of me when the answer was always at the start of me, always at the heart of me. There's no part of me that could break away and not find its way back again like a jigsaw piece lost for the longest time. And then I greeted again like a long lost friend that I promised I'd bind to myself until the very end. See you again around that bend. Now and then I comprehend that time will bend and I will break and minds will rend and first be slate that I am I and I am Jake forsaken. On the lake of time awakened, from the open up my eyes I'm shaken, from the cut ties with lies, heartbreaking, I've spoken.
My words are out in the open, play out my heart like Chopin. Show me the world like only you can. I'm hoping. Spin out a tale like token. Mend the heart that's broken. I've spoken. <laughs>